night we talked about Adventism for the 19th century, and we noticed what a tremendous relevance it had for that time and place, and what a tremendous impact it had on that time and place. And we asked the question, is it possible that Adventism could have the same kind of impact on the world today that it had back then. And so what I want to do tonight is go back to a topic that you've probably heard before, and it's the topic of the remnant. And once again, we will read the scripture a second time and a third time, seeking that perhaps there might be something uniquely placed for the 21st century, that this may be something that will tremendously enlighten us at this time. But before I get into that, and I may pay a price for this, but I would like to introduce my wife, who many of you have not met. People are asking me. We want to meet her, etc. And Pamela, would you kindly stand? I know that you're not a public person, but I'd appreciate if you would do so. And there she is. And now you can all see. <laughs> you can all see why I've come home from every trip that I've ever taken. <laughs> That's my girl. I love her very much. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the day we met. We haven't made the marriage thing yet, but uh, we've been together now 50 years. And I said, yeah, two-thirds of my life, you've been part of it. And that's quite a commitment on both our parts. And we're grateful to God for that. Those of you that may be familiar with the Revelation program on the Hope Channel, uh, where Graham Bradford and I were together, you will remember her because she played a role in that series as well. Uh, so she will probably try to slip out at the end, but if you'd like to meet her, uh, surround her before she gets away, okay? <laughs> like I said, I'll pay for that, yeah. That's a, I think it was worth it, though. Uh, yeah. All right, so we come to the open remnant. And I use the word open intentionally because I think sometimes in the past, we have studied the remnant with the idea that this is what we have, everybody else does not have it, and this is ours, and we are unique and we are special. And there's truth in that, a lot of truth in that. But I believe that when you go below the surface, God designed the concept of remnant to be open in a surprising way. And I want to walk you through the scriptures and show you why I've come to believe that. So we'll start with Revelation 12 and verse 17. And you're familiar with the text, I suspect, that says the dragon was angry with the woman and went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So I highlight there the word remnant. At the end of time, there would be a message that God has placed within the book of Revelation, a message that will be uniquely for the time of the end. And here in chapter 12, verse 17, he suggests that there will be a people who embrace that message and take it to the world at that time. So the big question tonight, who are they? Who is this remnant? And if you ask around among Seventh-day Adventists, you may hear a variety of answers. Uh, one of those would be all faithful Christians, that the remnant of Revelation is all faithful Christians. Perhaps more popular among Seventh-day Adventists is the idea that the remnant is the Seventh-day Adventist church, the institution, the denomination. A third idea that you may hear is that the remnant is the faithful 
among Seventh-day Adventists. In a sense, the remnant of the remnant, some might suggest. All right, so these are various ideas that you may hear, and it is because of some of those various conversations uh, that the Biblical Research Committee of the General Conference decided to restudy the remnant, to reopen the scriptures, look at them again, read them a second time, and see if there was more there that can enlighten us for today. And what I'm going to share with you tonight can largely be found in a book called The Remnant, uh, published by the General Conference in 2009. And in my view, uh, that book is a tremendous advance on what I knew for many years and appreciate it very much. I'll try to represent it as faithfully as I can. But the question you'll often hear is this concept of remnant is an arrogant thing. How can you claim to be the remnant? So those who say the remnant is the Seventh-day Adventist church, how can you claim that? It sounds so arrogant, it cuts everybody else out. I remember when I lived in Michigan, we had uh, a sort of a meter-high fence between us and the people in the backyard, and so you could see each other at work in the yard. And one day I was in the garden, which was just right up against that side of the fence, and on the other side of the fence was my neighbor, uh, who was trimming a tree just about uh, three meters away. And he came over to the fence. He says, you know, uh, you'll be interested in this. He says, recently I've been attending meetings at the Adventist church. And he says, I'm thinking of maybe joining. And I says, oh, that's great. He says, yeah, but there's one thing. There's one thing that bothers me. And I said, what's that? He says, it's the concept of the remnant. It's so arrogant. And I think... I have heard run into this time and again in a variety of contexts, particularly as people get younger, and he was quite a bit younger than me. Uh, the younger generation has trouble with this issue of the remnant, and it's for that reason that the church decided to restudy the issue and see if we could maybe present it in a more helpful way. So let's take a look at that. Let's go to Revelation and ask the question, who are the remnant? What is their identity? What do we know about them from the book of Revelation? And uh, one of those things is it comes at the end of chapter 12. Chapter 12, as we saw the first night, uh, kind of runs a history from the birth of Jesus all the way to the final events of earth's history. And in the context of the end of history appears this remnant as the very final people of God. So it comes at the end of earth's history. It comes, as we saw last night, at the close of Daniel's time prophecies. So when you get to that point in history where Daniel's time prophecies run out, a remnant will appear. And then we discover that it, the remnant will have a prophetic visionary gift. We don't have time to go into that in detail, but I do believe that it indicates that the final uh, generation of God's people on this earth will be able to point to a prophetic visionary gift that will help guide God's people through the final days of earth's history. Another characteristic is that this remnant is the object of worldwide attention. The whole idea of a mark of the beast on the forehead and hand is directed against Revelation's remnant. So they are known to the world, objects of attention. Not only that, they have a message that is of worldwide significance. In other words, everybody's talking about it. It'll be on CNN. Uh, it'll be on, uh, is it uh, CBN, Canadian Broadcasting Network? In other words, everybody's going to be talking about it. Now you ask yourself, is the remnant the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, in some ways, it certainly sounds familiar here. But is the Adventist Church the object of worldwide attention? In some places, perhaps. 
Does that have a message of worldwide significance? Is everybody talking about it? Well, so you see, the evidence of revelation leaves us with some questions that we need to further uh, explore. A second side of this is the message of the remnant, and what I'm going to share with you now, I shared with you last night. When you look carefully at the book of Revelation, you see a package of ideas that will be significant at the end of time. And they are, among other things, the gospel, and the gospel in the context of Daniel and Revelation, the heavenly sanctuary, keeping all God's commandments, and there's no point in mentioning keeping the commandments unless there are commandments that are neglected. Keeping all the commandments is important here. Warning of end time deception. Relationship with Jesus. Hour of judgment. And the Sabbath. And you'll notice there's some texts I place with each of those. If we had an hour for each of these, it would be a profitable study. Uh, so you'll have to take it on faith a little bit. These 13 items, the identity of the remnant, the message of the remnant, are things that I have studied and presented in a variety of contexts. But for tonight, just take them on faith. This is what Revelation says the remnant is all about. And the question is, what do we do with that information? Does this look familiar to you? this list of items. It is familiar, right? It does sound like the Seventh-day Adventist message. How did that happen? Simply this, the Adventist pioneers studied the book of Revelation, discovered that it was presenting a message that no one else was sharing. And so they said, well, if no one else is doing it, we need to do this. We need to study it and share it with the world. Now, I would argue that's not arrogant. It's not saying we're special. It's simply saying uh, that God has called us to take the message of revelation to the world. We didn't invent the message. We didn't make it up. There's nothing to be boasting about here. There's nothing arrogant about presenting a message that is already in the scriptures and simply saying to people, let's pay attention to this. The end is coming. This is critical. This is important. All right? So, let's go back into the Old Testament and discover the origin of the concept of the remnant. And when we do, we'll discover something that was not known before. And as papers came in to the Biblical Research Committee, it became clear that remnant was not one thing in the Bible. It was several things. And that opened a window that I think is extremely exciting. I hope you will like it. So in the book of Revelation, remnant was a concept that had multiple meanings. And that may help us to clarify some things about the remnant today. We start with Abraham. Father Abraham received a covenant with God. And that covenant was universal and everlasting, as it says in Genesis 17, 7. In Genesis 12, God said to Abraham, I have called you because I want you to be a blessing to the nations. A blessing to the nations. God didn't call Abraham for himself. God called Abraham because he wanted to use him to be a blessing to everybody, not just Abraham and his descendants. In Genesis 17, 7, it says, an everlasting covenant would come through Abraham. In Exodus 19, it says of Israel, Abraham's descendants, you are a kingdom of priests. What is a priest? It's someone who stands between God and the people. What is a kingdom of priests? It would be a nation that stands between God and the other nations, that God would use Israel like a priest to bring his message to the world. So God's plan for Abraham 
was an expansive plan, a universal plan, a worldwide plan for the nations. But it didn't happen when Israel entered the Promised Land. Joshua is not the fulfillment of this because when Israel entered Canaan, the nations were not blessed. And God's intention was not just for Israel, but to restore the whole world back to himself, to restore the Garden of Eden, to restore what was lost because of sin. Did Israel follow through on that mission? Apparently not. Old Testament Israel failed to obtain the promise. When you go through that history, you think of the time of the judges. What a confused and chaotic time that was. You think of Solomon, a peak where the whole world was beginning to be blessed by Israel. Queen of Sheba came from far away because she wanted a piece of what was happening in Israel. So you were beginning to get the glimmer of what God had promised to Abraham and to Israel. But then Solomon fell away. And Jeroboam split the kingdom into two. And Ahab began worshiping idols instead of the true God. And then Manasseh forbade the worship of Yahweh in Israel. Downhill, down and down it went, followed by captivity and eventually occupation. You see, the history of Israel in the Old Testament was a history of failure and disgrace. But here's one thing I've discovered about God, the amazing God, is that God is more flexible than I am. That God can take a messed up situation and bring good into it. You may not like the outcome at times. You may say it's not gone far enough, but God does what he can when he can. And he never overrides people's freedom of choice. And because he never overrides people's freedom of choice, things don't go in a straight line. Like the stock market, they go up and down. And that's the story of Israel. Was God caught by surprise? I don't think so. God had a plan. He had a plan B, if you want to call it, and that was a remnant. That God would do with a remnant of Israel what he could not do with Israel as a whole. And God's response to that failure was a threefold remnant. Remember I said there's, there's a multifaceted remnant going on here. A threefold remnant. First of all, there was a historical remnant. At any point in time, if you looked into the past, thinking Old Testament right now, at any point looking in the past, you could see a historical remnant. You could name it, you could count it, you could tell its story. For example, Noah was a remnant from the flood. The first time the word remnant appears in the Bible is in the, the flood story, referring to Noah. Abraham was a remnant from the 70 nations of the world. Israel was a remnant that came out of Egyptian slavery. Again, later on, Israel had a remnant that came out of Assyrian conquest. So there have been historical remnants. But here's the key. Historical remnants are important. Historical remnants are people whose ancestors saw a mighty act of God and became excited about that. So remnants are historical reminders of what God did in the past. But are historical remnants faithful? Not necessarily. Take a look at this passage, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 6. O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again 
to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Is the remnant that escaped from the hands of the kings of Assyria faithful to God? No. God is calling them to return to him. So if you look at the historical remnants in the Old Testament, they are usually a mixed bag. Some faithful people, some not so faithful people. Some of the remnants were just totally unfaithful. So historical remnants are not necessarily faithful, but their existence is a reminder of something God did in the past, saving Noah and his family from the flood, uh, saving Israel out of Egypt. The existence of Israel, even when they were unfaithful, still reminded people of what God had done before. So historical remnants play an important role, but there's nothing to brag about being a historical remnant. Because historical remnants generally are a mixed bag at best of faithful and unfaithful people. A second type of remnant is the faithful remnant. And that tends to be present tense. Within every historical remnant in the Old Testament, there were some who were faithful. There were some that God could count on. These were the faithful remnant. Let me give you an example of that, and that would be 1 Kings chapter 19. That remnant would not necessarily be visible. The historical remnants are visible. You can count them, you can name them, you can describe their story, you can see who they are. They're visible. But the faithful remnant are known only to God. Because only God knows who in this auditorium tonight is faithful and who is not. Only God knows that. You see, so it's invisible. The faithful remnant is invisible. You may have some clues, but it is invisible. Notice how this is brought out in 1 Kings 19. Elijah says to God, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah is a prophet of God. This is his testimony. That word left on the screen is the Hebrew word for remnant. Elijah was the remnant of Israel. Israel as a whole was unfaithful. They were breaking the covenant. They were tearing down the altars of God. They were ignoring the temple. They were killing the prophets. And Elijah said, faithful remnant, only one. It's me. And what did God say to him? Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Remember I said the faithful remnant is invisible? Think about this. A prophet of God, Elijah, doesn't know about 6,999 faithful people. If even the prophet of God can't tell you where all the faithful are, clearly this is something that is known ultimately only to God. So the faithful remnant are those within a historical remnant who still are committed to the original mission, the original message that God gave that historical remnant. So God has his faithful ones in every historical remnant. Third, third type of remnant is future tense. It is the eschatological remnant. At any point in history, you can look in the past and see a historical remnant Name it, count it, visible. A faithful remnant in the present, known only to God. But then you can also look forward to a future remnant, an end time remnant, that would arise out of those first two remnants. 
And this eschatological remnant would be bigger, more unpredictable, surprising. If you go through the Old Testament and you look at the historical, at the future remnants, the eschatological remnants, they're always surprising. They're bigger than anybody expected. They go in directions that no one might have anticipated. The end time remnants catch you by surprise. Let's take an example of that. Isaiah 66 and verses 19 and 20. Where God says, from them I will send survivors to the nations. The them is the faithful in Israel. So Israel, the historical remnant, has a faithful remnant which God will send to the nations. This word survivors here in this translation, this remnant language, once again. I will send a remnant, a faithful remnant, to the nations. What nations? Nations that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. So this text anticipates a time when a faithful remnant will go out to those nations that don't know God, that do not give him glory, that do not know him. And they, the remnant, will declare my glory among the nations that have not heard of God or seen his glory. And they, the remnant, will bring all your brothers, do you get that? Who are brothers in the faith? Bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just like the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. I mean, Isaiah's brain must have been melting as he wrote this down. God is anticipating a day when he's going to find brothers Sisters, kindred spirits in the last place you'd expect, Assyria and Egypt and Babylon and the far reaches of the earth, Greece, the islands, etc. This was mind-blowing to ancient Israel that kind of came to think that we're all there is that God has, like Elijah. You know, we are the remnant and that's that. Isaiah says God is going to do something big something surprising, something you wouldn't have guessed. One more text, because I think this is important. It's a text that was read to us a little bit earlier. In that day, which is a Hebrew expression for the end time, in that day there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. Now, just so you understand that, Egypt is still Egypt, so we kind of get that. Assyria is basically what Iraq is today. So in a Middle Eastern map, Assyria was Iraq, Egypt is Egypt, and Israel was in between. And here's the interesting thing. God anticipates a day when the Egyptians and the Assyrians will be connected with each other, when they will visit each other, and when they will worship together. Now this would have been stunning for Isaiah, because the Egyptians and the Assyrians were the superpowers of the ancient world, and they hated each other. They often were in battle over Israel in between them. And so Isaiah is kind of like, the Egyptians and Assyrians worshiping together? What's going on? But verse 24 raises the level once again. In that day, that Hebrew term for the end time, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. Did you see what God just did there? Remember Abraham? God called Abraham to do what? Bless the nations. What does Isaiah 19 say? Egypt and Assyria, those enemy powers, will now join with Israel in being a blessing to the world. 
I mean, Isaiah, but this just went beyond anything he could have anticipated. And then it concludes, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed. Who? Egypt, Assyria, Israel, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. That's a phrase God used only for Israel before. My people. Blessed be Egypt, my people. And Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, my inheritance. Do you catch the significance of this? When you look at the remnant concept in the Old Testament, it's multifaceted, but it holds out a hope that ahead of any remnant is something way bigger and way more exciting than they had imagined. Now we're going to come to later times, but let's just soak in for a moment. I'd like us to do something absolutely amazing here, okay? Let's imagine we could raise Isaiah from the dead, okay? And bring him here to camp meeting in Alberta. Would that be cool or what? And Isaiah's standing here in the platform with me, and, and he's trying to process what exactly is going on here. And I'll say, well, Isaiah, as you looked into the past, who was the historical remnant? And he would say, well, of course, the Israel of the Exodus. That was my people. Were they faithful? <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> Not very. <laughs> okay, so who's the faithful remnant? And Isaiah said, ah, oh, those would be the faithful in Babylon. You know, those that they went into captivity, but those that were faithful that God would bring back. And then you'd say to Isaiah, what's the eschatological remnant? He says, well, I'm not sure, but it's sounding pretty big. And then I'll tell Isaiah, Isaiah, do you realize that in today's world there are two billion people that read your book and that have embraced Yahweh as their God? What would Isaiah say? I didn't see that coming. That is unbelievable. Because you see, ultimately for the New Testament, the church is the eschatological remnant of Isaiah. First of all, of course, it's those who came back from Babylon. But in the bigger picture, the remnant of Isaiah is the church. And the church is way bigger than anything Isaiah could have imagined. People from every nation. Remember Isaiah 66? That is fulfilled. Remember Genesis 12? That is fulfilled in Isaiah's future. It's fulfilled in the church. And it was bigger, more international, more surprising than Isaiah could have expected. All right, well, let's go on to the remnant in the New Testament. And I'm just sampling here, trying to give you the big picture without all of the details. You can read the book if you want more details. But there was a remnant in Paul's day, and it was also threefold. Let's take a look at Romans 11. Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Who would be God's people for Paul? The Israel, right? The Jewish nation. His people. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee. That's his people. So Paul says, has God rejected his people? The Jewish people. Paul's answer, by no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So what is Paul saying? I know that God hasn't rejected the Jews. What is his reason for believing that? He says, I'm a Jew and I'm following Jesus. He says, I am evidence that God has not given up on the Jews. So Paul says, the Jewish people remain with a role in God's plan. Remember historical remnants? 
It doesn't matter whether they're faithful or not. By their very existence, they still recall to people the mighty acts of God. What did the Jews do for the world that maybe nobody else except maybe some Seventh-day Adventists have accomplished? The world knows about the Sabbath, and the world has the Old Testament. Those are two enormous gifts, aren't they, to the world? More people know about the Sabbath because of Jews than Seventh-day Adventists. So by their very existence, Jews are still playing a role in the plan of God as a historical remnant. But who's the faithful remnant? Let's see. Paul says, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul says, God has not rejected the Jewish people. How do I know? Because there's a remnant chosen by grace. There are many, many Jews in Paul's day who followed Jesus, who embraced the Messiah. So Paul describes a historical remnant, Old Testament Israel, a faithful remnant amidst his people. But Paul goes another step. Paul takes it into the future. And look at this. This is amazing. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, who's they? This is the Jewish people again. Historical Israel. If their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So Paul says, yes, when you look at historical Israel, you see a lot of people who have uh, rejected what we're talking about here. Uh, in a sense, there is some failure there. But Paul says, if that's still a gift, if Judaism is still giving gifts as it is, what would that be amazing when they're all brought in? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, Paul says here. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? You see, Paul grasped the Old Testament idea, and he said, yes, many Jews have rejected Jesus, and thus they cannot play the role in the end-time remnant that God had originally planned. But, he says, that rejection opened the door for the Gentiles. And the Gentiles have come pouring in. The blessing of Abraham to the nations is being fulfilled in the gospel message. And he says, if the bringing in of the Gentiles is amazing, what will be even more amazing is the re-acceptance of the Jewish people fully into God's plan. You see, Paul has an amazing vision of the future. That not only will Christians be around when the end of time comes, but Jews in large numbers will come and be part of God's end time message and remnant. So, for Paul, shall we resurrect him from the dead too? Okay. And bring him up here to stand next to me. Would not that be cool? All right? And you ask Paul, what was the historical remnant of your day? And he would say, yeah, Old Testament Israel, the Jewish people, absolutely, my people. Not always faithful, but my people, God's people. Who would the faithful remnant be? Paul would probably say, those Jews who follow Jesus. And then I'd say, Paul, what about the eschatological remnant? Did he tell the story of Romans 11 that he believes that God will bring the Jews back at the end of time. And then I inform Paul that there are two billion people in the world that read his letters. 
and follow Jesus and what would Paul say? I didn't see that coming. What, I, what I'm trying to get across here is this multifaceted remnant opens up windows of exciting hope that maybe we hadn't believed was possible. Let's go to Revelation. Is there a remnant also in Revelation? Is it bigger, more international, and unpredictable than the earlier remnants? In Revelation, remnant is also threefold. The president of Oakwood University, Leslie Pollard, wrote a dissertation on the remnant in the book of Revelation. And uh, so much research has been added uh, to the earlier research in recent times. And Revelation also has a remnant. The dragon was angry with the woman and went away to make war with the remnant of her seed. That word remnant, Pollard pointed out, occurs multiple times in Revelation. And what you have here is the eschatological remnant of the church. In other words, the New Testament is pointing forward to the end of time when God will again have a remnant. And that Paul is, uh, John is talking about the eschatological remnant of the church. But at the same time, this group of people will be the historical remnant of the end time. In other words, when the end time comes, there will be a people that you can name and count and talk about. But also in Revelation, there's a faithful remnant. In the church of Thyatira, it says, to the remnant, same word, loipos, remnant of you in Thyatira, as many as do not hold her teaching, those who have not learned the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden upon you. So in the church of Thyatira, there was a faithful remnant in the midst of a church that was largely apostate. So you see, historical remnants may by their existence bear testimony to what God has done in the past. But within each of them, there is a faithful remnant that God will call out if necessary when the time comes. So the church of Thyatira has an example of a faithful remnant. The same three remnants occurs again in Revelation. Revelation 14, 6, and 7. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Do you see the vision here? It is God's intent that the message of the remnant will come to every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. I would argue one thing is left out because it couldn't have been said back then, and that would be every religion. That the message of the remnant is not just an in-house thing among Christians, but that God has a vision that expands far beyond what we would call Christianity, to go even further, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. So the final message of earth's history is summed up in those words, fear God and give glory to him. Now I want to take you to one more text in Revelation that blew my mind when I first saw it in this context. It talks about the very last era of verse history in Revelation 11. And it says, in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. That city is the great city. We might call it Babylon. So there will be a time in the symbolic vision, a tenth of the city fell. This is the enemy city. This is those who oppose God at the end of time. How much is a tenth? Ten percent, right? Okay. Seven thousand people were killed by the earthquake. And the remnant, how big would that remnant be? Who's left? Ninety percent. The remnant became afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Are those words familiar? We just read them in chapter 14. The final message of earth's history, 
fear God and give him glory. Chapter 11 has a remnant that fears God and brings him glory. And that remnant is way more than a tiny remnant. It's something bigger, surprising. Now, don't get me wrong. Revelation is a symbolic book. I don't think it's saying exactly 90% of people will be saved. You get a different impression in other parts of the book. But what it's saying is that remnants aren't necessarily small, that there's potential for something really huge in this remnant concept. And here in Revelation 11, it's telling us that that remnant might far exceed, just like it did for Isaiah, just like it did for Paul, it may far exceed. When the time comes, we too will probably say, we didn't see that coming. So who's the remnant of Revelation? The remnant of Revelation comes at the end of time. And remember, at any point in history, you can see three remnants, right? You can look in the past and see a remnant. In the present, there's a faithful remnant. In the future, there's an end time remnant. Who is the historical remnant of Revelation? I would say the Seventh-day Adventist Church, historic Adventism. Is that arrogant? I don't think so. Because historical remnants are always what? They're a mixed bag. There's nothing to brag about being part of a historical remnant, because historical remnants tend to be very unreliable. But what do historical remnants do? By their very existence, they remind people of what God did at some point in the past. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a living representative of a mighty act of God that happened in the 19th century that we talked about yesterday. God brought fresh light regarding the end of time. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church was raised up to honor what God did and to bring it to the world. Like every other such remnant, there are flaws. Remember I told you that the kind of young people my son is engaging regularly. Most of them are very disappointed with the church, whether it's the Adventist church or any other, because historical remnants are rarely super faithful. It's simply a reality. And when you realize that, you don't expect more than a historical remnant can bring. You go through history, and historical remnants are always flawed. And I think when we recognize that, we will have more credibility in the world. Because the world sees a church that says, we're the thing, and the world looks at it and says, no, you're not the thing. I've tasted it. It's not good, you see? And the sooner we come and say, you know, you're probably right. But our mission here is not to point to ourselves. Our mission is to point to God. And we can still do that as historical remnants, just like Israel could still do it, just like the Jewish people could do it. Some people have come to me and then said, and let me just say, who's the faithful remnant? I would argue the faithful remnant of Revelation is those within the Seventh-day Adventist church that still have a clear picture of the message and the mission that God gave back in the 19th century. And some of my friends say, well, can't Lutherans be part of the remnant? And I say, no, not in this sense. Why? Because the remnant of Revelation has a package of ideas that is unique. Lutherans are not giving that message. In fact, I and others have sat down with leaders of the Lutheran Church and discussed Adventist eschatology. And they acknowledge at the end, you have a message that we can't give. And they did one of the most beautiful, generous things I've ever seen. They said, you know, we cannot give the message you give, but go and give it with our blessing. Give it with our blessing. I mean, that blew my mind. That was amazing. But looking at this larger picture of remnant, can you include Lutherans in the concept of remnant? 
Would they not by their very existence remind us of the Reformation and the mighty work that God did there? Dare I even say it? More people know about the cross and the New Testament because Roman Catholics exist than because Adventists exist. Is that true? It is through that early church that the New Testament was put together. And the early church came to understand the Godhead as a trinity and many other things by their existence. Is the Roman Catholic Church faithful? Probably no more than any of the other historical remnants, right? But by its very existence, people are connecting with some important things. So you see, this multiple remnant concept enables us to speak about the remnant without being arrogant. Just saying remnants have a multiple perspective. But that doesn't mean just anybody can be the remnant of revelation in the historical sense, but it has to be the people that grasp the message when it came to this world. So the faithful remnant for today of revelation would be those among Seventh-day Adventists who clearly understand the message and the mission. Who are the eschatological remnant of revelation? That is still to come. And all I can say for tonight is that it'll be bigger, more international, more unpredictable, more surprising than we imagine. Like Isaiah and Paul, one day I think we too will say we didn't see it coming. Now, this is where we came as a committee in understanding the remnant concept, but it doesn't tell us how this end time remnant will come together. Well, would you be interested in me speculating just a little as to how that might happen? Don't miss tomorrow night. Because <laughs> I'm going to walk you from the time of revelation to today through history and take a second look at the whole great controversy scenario. And there are historians in today's world that are starting to sound like the book Great Controversy. And I'm going to share that with you and show you that there is a potential vision of how the remnant of revelation could change the world in the very near future. So we'll bring that out tomorrow night. And that will be my view, okay? Don't blame the General Conference for anything I say tomorrow. You just weigh that with scripture and, and, and pray about it, and et cetera. And if it, uh, if it opens up some windows, great. But this is, I'm just going to share with you uh, what I have observed through history and experience as a frontier missionary, uh, some exciting things that I think potential that we may have at times overlooked. So let me summarize the remnant today. I think we learned that there's more than one remnant in scripture and history. And if that's the case, Seventh-day Adventists can be a remnant without being arrogant. It simply means when God does a great work, we don't despise it, we don't ignore it, we embrace it and let it go wherever it leads us. So there's more than one remnant in scripture and more than one remnant in history. But there's no guarantee for historical remnants. Simply because you're a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is no more a guarantee of salvation than if you're a Lutheran or Catholic or a Jew. No guarantee for historical remnants. What counts is faithfulness to the message and mission that God has given. But last word, something way bigger is coming. Stay tuned tomorrow night. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we view the promises you have made to your prophets through scripture, we are awed by the possibility that you might do something with us that we are totally incapable of doing. You might do something with us that will go beyond anything we could expect. And Lord, we realize probably the biggest barrier to that is ourselves. 
that we ourselves may not believe what you could do with us, that we may, ourselves may at times not even want that to happen. We like our little church. We like our comfortable existence. Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts with the need of the world and with the call of Abraham to be a blessing to the nations, every nation, tribe, language, people, and religion. I pray, Lord, you may open our eyes to the possibilities of what you may be about to do. We look forward to learning more in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, welcome, folks. We're back here with uh, Dr. Pauline's Afterthoughts. That's what he suggested we call this little <laughs> show. So we haven't gotten anything else, so I think we're going to run with it. I did promise that Pastor Jordan would be here tonight, but unfortunately, one of our colleagues happened to get injured in his uh, kids' uh, uh, division here. So she has graciously volunteered to step into the breach with uh, some of the younger kids, so she'll be over there. And for tonight, I've recruited uh, my good friend, Pastor Dan, again to come in here, and we're going to... You stuck with me. Yeah, we're, we're... Well, I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, Dr. Pauline, you're here again. Uh, so, so, John, great message tonight. Me and Dan were both talking about how uh, you know, excited we are for this conversation. And if I were to sort of summarize, uh, you know, my main takeaway would be, um, and, and this is a pretty old classification within Adventism, right? I think, uh, oh, his name escapes me now, uh, Hazel, Gerhard mm -hmm. Hazel, came mm -hmm. up with the, you know, historical remnant, the faithful remnant, the eschatological remnant. But what I think you brought to the table is, is putting those in a temporal organization. So the historical will be past, um, faithful will be present, eschatological future. I think that's a, a helpful way of looking at it. And I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to have to steal that idea if you don't mind. If I may speak to that. Sure. Um, the interesting thing about it, as far as I know, Gerhard Hazel, uh, who was one of my teachers, mm -hmm. uh, never published that within an Adventist context, as far yeah. as I know. Yeah. Because uh, when it's referenced, it's referencing a, a non-Adventist encyclopedia right. that he wrote for. Mm -hmm. And it was his nephew, uh, Frank Hazel, mm -hmm. who, studying that and presented it to the committee, and it, for me, it was just like, wow, yeah. you know, that <laughs> is mind blowing. And perhaps I could understand maybe back then, uh, Gerhard Hassel felt like this was too explosive mm. for people to handle. Uh, but I think uh, it came out at just the time when we needed it. And, and our whole committee was just amazed at uh, this uh, new perspective on, on the scripture. Yeah, and it's definitely there in the Bible in my view. Uh, Dan, what did you think? Anything you wanted to, you know, just throw out for our online audience as your as your main takeaway, and you guys can feel free to leave something in the comments yourselves. Go ahead. Dave. Oh yeah, my main takeaway, no question, was this repeated idea that God is up to bigger things than we can ever imagine, and how you showed how that's been happening through history. Like, I was thinking as you were speaking, Elijah said, "I'm the only one left." Mm -hmm. Oh no, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. I, There's I, a lot more. I, I hardly ever preach on the remnant without re referencing that text in Romans. Right? Yeah. It's probably going to be about seven times, seven thousand times, <laughs> or whatever bigger than you think it is. Yeah. If Elijah's experience is anything to go by, right? Yeah. And and we we don't see the path from here to there, so we we have a hard time believing it. Yeah. Yeah. And neither could Elijah. And, and that's okay, right? Um, it's part of our human experience to have limited perspective. Yeah. And that means that we can let God work. Right, and, and be awed at what he does. Yes. Um, anything you wanted to just leave the people with here just as we get underway? Are, are we capturing your, your sermon well? Anything you want to add again or you know, just throw it as well, your Well, your Dan was on? saying something just before that I thought was significant. Maybe you want to share that? And yeah, let's go into that, Dan. Yeah, ask, so, your, ask your question. So for a while now, I've been listening to a series of podcasts on cults and look, trying to look at the common denominators and what makes these things thrive and go on. And the one major common denominator is that all of their leaders say, you know, we have this thing, and if you join us and believe this thing, then you're in, and if you're not, you're out. And do you think that Adventism, either corporately or within the rank and file, have somewhat fallen into that mentality of we have this special thing, and because we have it, we're in, and everybody else is in. And, and by in, I think you mean here, like, existentially, right? Like, if, if you're not in, then you're going to, you know, have something terrible is going to happen to you, right? Yeah. Like, that's sort of the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it actually would be surprising if we didn't fall into that. And I, I could look back 
many times in my own past and, and, and having that kind of thought uh, as well. It happened with Israel. Right. Uh, you know, we've got the temple, so nothing could possibly go wrong. Mm. And the prophets are coming in and say, whoa, 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 uh, don't get so stuck on yourself. Um, what is religion? Ultimately, religion is a human response to a mighty act of God. Mm. And people sense God is here, God has done something amazing, and they create a structure to honor what God did mm. and to share it with the world. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. The problem is that over time, religions tend to get stuck on their own existence and lose touch with the original vision. So God keeps moving yeah. and we fail to move with him. Exactly, you see. And so I think, I think the message for me in all of this is to, on the one hand, honor the church, yeah. delight in the church, the church fed me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went through seminary and all of that. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for the church. The church has done amazing things for me. At the same time, it's a human organization with flaws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our kids see it so clearly. Mm. And you're not going to get anywhere with the kids by saying, you know, well, you should change your eyesight. Right? Mm. We're more mm -hmm. likely to get somewhere with the kids if we just say, you know, as a church, we failed. As a parent, I failed. Right. And... Uh, you know, I'm sorry about that, but I'm flawed, just like you, and together, let's, let's try to make a difference. Let's change all that. Mm. I think it's interesting that you bring in the kids, because as you were saying that, I was thinking of developmental dynamics and how difficult it can be to achieve that kind of adult-to-adult -adult relationship with your parents. That's really important for yeah. like a, you know, a healthy middle age, you know, and going yeah. into senior years, right? Um, and how therefore also important it is to achieve an adult to adult relationship with the church because Jesus said we're not supposed to have spiritual daddies here on earth mm -hmm. you know the church is not my spiritual mommy as it is in some other religions I need to achieve an adult adult relationship with my church and that means not being perpetually in either a state of childish uh, subservience or adolescent rebellion against the church mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. And then I also thought about us as church leaders, right? How to bring people into an adult adult relationship with the church, you know, and, and let them go through those phases of childhood, adolescence, and spiritual maturity. I don't know. Uh, your, your comments really prompted reflection. Oh, there. definitely. I mean, I think of Ephesians 4, where Paul mm -hmm. is saying the purpose of all the spiritual gifts mm -hmm. is to grow the church to maturity. Right to an adult way of thinking. Jesus said, unless you become a child, you won't enter the kingdom. He doesn't say you won't stay in the kingdom. <laughs> right. All right? Yeah. We, may, we need to be a child to enter the kingdom, but yeah. then he wants us to grow up right. and, and, uh, and become adults because God wants to engage us in an adult level. Yeah. And, and the more we can grow, the more God will enjoy us yeah. and, and, and enjoy relationship with us. I mean, that's, that, that's amazing to me. I think, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I never anticipated how important it would be to me as I grew older that my kids would be in the faith. Yeah. And my heart goes out to any of you watching this program where, where you, you feel like you're losing your kids. Yeah. Uh, I remember once I was speaking to a room full of pastors and sharing the differences between generations and how that impacts our own young people in the way they relate to their parents and to the church. Mm -hmm. And I had six of those pastors, one by one, separately, come to me during that week, break down and cry, and said, I've ruined my children. Mm. What do I do? Mm. And to each one I said, an apology mm. would be a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. if you have ruined your kids, it's not the end of the world. But you're not going to rebuild that relationship without acknowledging where you've fallen short and committing with them together uh, to grow back together as a family and, and as believers in, in Christ. Mm. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the fact that, that my kids are uh, self-generating, whatever you call it, yeah. Christians who of their own choice yeah. means so much to me. Amen. And my heart goes out to anyone who, who hasn't had that experience. And uh, I pray that God will, will help you to see where the barrier is and to the degree that you can 
to uh, to bridge that gap. Mm. Uh, the best uh, book I've ever seen on that was actually written in 1975, and it's called Path to the Heart by Glenn Kuhn. It's how to witness to your family members with whom you have a tense relationship regarding religion. Hmm. Never seen a better book on that, even though it's more than 50 years old. Somebody's got it on Amazon, so you should be able to find it. Uh, that book, just uh, just amazing, uh, how it, it hits right to the core of where the problems are in such a relationship. Well, let's shift gears maybe and talk about, um, you know, as far as, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, how do we retain people within God's remnant movement? Mm -hmm. What about the time when, you know, all these folks come in that uh, we, we just can't even anticipate? Um, when you were preaching on that, I was thinking about there being two different ways to kill an organization. Uh, because people think that it's it's decline that kills an organization, but it's really it's really the rate of growth or decline that kills an organization. Right? Mm -hmm. An organization can survive if it declines slowly. Right? Mm -hmm. It can also survive if it grows slowly. But shrink it or grow it too quickly, that's what can really blow things up. Right? <laughs> and I, I'm, yeah. I've been thinking about recently about our church structure and, and how would it survive a rapid influx of people into the Seventh Day Adventist movement. Mm -hmm. Even should it survive, right? It, it certainly couldn't survive, I think, in its current form, because we are, I don't think, currently organized for rapid growth. And that's not a knock on the organization. That's just the nature of most organizations, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if if we if we grew by more than you know 15% a year, uh, if, if that that would become very uh, a very difficult challenge to manage and. I don't see us as, as a Seventh-day Adventist Church organization positioning ourselves for that kind of thing. But we do have some examples, and uh, one that would jump out to me is Brazil, mm. uh, which by far is the most Adventist country in the world in the sense of, of sheer numbers. Yes. I think we're talking millions. Right. Uh, the United States has a million or so. Brazil is probably double that. Right. Uh, and uh, rapid, rapid growth. and. Mm. I have found Brazil to be the most dynamic country I've been to in terms of Adventism. And yes, uh, and it's, it is. That the young people are passionate about it, but they're not closed-minded either. Yeah. Mm. And they're able to engage the world without mm -hmm. throwing away their own faith. I, I'm, I'm very impressed uh, with that. So it is yeah. possible yeah. Uh, to grow rapidly and, uh, and still maintain that cohesion and that uh, spiritual uh, thing. But, you know, Brazil has its struggles as well. Mexico, southern Mexico, is another place where the church almost doubled uh, every year for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, that had tremendous excitement and, of course, also brings its challenges. Right, right. But here, here in North America, it seems like we're just not ready. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, let me jump in with a question that relates. <clears throat> so you talked about the historic remnant today being historic Adventism mm -hmm. and the present remnant being Adventists who are faithful to that package of beliefs. And that the future remnant is a big thing that God's going to do that we can't anticipate. So given that, what should we be doing, could we be doing to position ourselves yeah. now since we don't necessarily know what he's going to do? <laughs> well, you know, I have to say as a pastor giving Bible studies, one of the things that always disappointed me, it never seemed to fail, that I'd sit down with somebody after a few weeks, they would excitedly tell me one day, because of you, I'm a better Catholic than I was before. Because of you, I'm a better Lutheran than I was before. And so, I, and I was kind of disappointed. And I'm rethinking that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, it, it, the remnant concept, if each of these bodies is in some way corporately, uh, still has a, a message that God can use. Right. All right. Even though it's flawed, even though it's uh, mixed messages at best, that there's still some things God can use. Uh, if the faithful remnant within each of those entities are those who really grasp what those bodies could and should have been, yeah. uh, is that not a big step forward? Yes. If at some point God brings together this larger remnant of kindred spirits, they'll be part of it. You see, so I, I, I'm not as disappointed as I used to be. I, I know eventually many of them will will advance uh, in truth and, and beyond that, etc. But, but realizing maybe that was not a failure, but it was simply God restoring 
a faithful remnant that uh, that maybe wasn't always there. So, sec follow-up question: Do you think it's possible? I said last night I'm blogging through Matthew. Do you think it's possible that we will be as out of step with the big thing God does as the disciples were out of step with what Jesus was trying to do when He was here? Sadly, I suppose it could happen. You know, um, again, if you take the biblical models. Uh, the big biblical model was Israel mm -hmm. and they studied the prophecies mm -hmm. they were careful in their diet yeah. they paid tithes yeah. they kept the Sabbath from sundown to sundown yeah. I mean they were as good Adventists as you could get mm -hmm. they looked forward to the coming of the Messiah you That's see it. and yet Jesus didn't quite fit their picture of the future. Mm -hmm. God was doing something bigger and different than they anticipated, and as a result of that, many rejected him. So if you, how do I say this delicately, if you are overly certain about what God is going to do in the future, yeah. and by the way, 2,000 years of history, if you read Froome's Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, yeah. Uh, those who predict the future on the basis of their study of the Bible have usually been wrong, yeah. at least in part. Yeah. Uh, so that should humble us to say, the future is still in God's control, not mine. Mm. And I may know a lot of things about the future from prophecy, but history tells me that knowing the future in advance uh, is still a dicey proposition, even with prophecy. And so a little bit of humility, uh, a little bit of uncertainty is probably a healthy thing so that when the real thing comes, you'll be open to the possibility that God would be working here and not just close your mind. That couldn't be God because it's supposed to happen this way. Mm. That's the pattern I see in history, and we're not immune to that. Uh, just as the Pharisees rejected Jesus because he didn't fit their scenario, I fear that if our scenario is too carefully laid out, we might make the same mistake. When the real thing happens, we're looking in another direction. I think we have to be mindful of that. And that brings us back to the topic of, uh, I think, the previous night. We really do need the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about our faithfulness. It's about God's faithfulness to us. Yeah. And then we respond to that. Yeah. So, you know, we can't, you know, rest comfortably on our biblical interpretations, our prophetic interpretations, our remnant status in the remnant trajectory, any of that sort of thing, and say, well, now we've, we're ready to go, right? It's God's faithfulness, and so we have to leave the door open for God to do what he does best, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think on that point, we could conclude, but would you like to leave us with a last word, John? Well, let's keep looking forward together. And uh, remnant is a real possibility for each of us. Amen. It has multiple dimensions. Yeah. And uh, what God is going to do with us is not totally visible yet. So mm. let's look forward to that. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. And God bless you all.